Good afternoon and uh, welcome all to the, the Mining and Energy Transition Financing Panel. The panel is raring to go. We've been in the green room for the last hour and a half building our thoughts, so uh, we, we hope to have maximum impact with you. We're going to touch on three or four topics uh, around the, how the funding financing of the processing of the critical minerals are being funded across all the different capital pools. From, from equity, project financing, to, to loans and bonds, and every conceivable instrument that in, sits in between those two bookends. We'll then touch a little bit on the, the, the new evolution of ESG and sustainability metrics that are being incorporated in some of those financing instruments. We'll touch upon the bulks in relation to how to contemplate financing the new decarbonisation technologies, and by bulks I mean largely steel and iron ore. And of course, uh, just as important, uh, we'll then localise it uh, with, uh, with how PIF as a sovereign fund uh, looks to support the, the mining sector within Kingdom of Saudi. So let's kick off, if I may. Uh, Mike, I'd like to invite you uh, to, to start and perhaps share with us the current availability of capital uh, to fund the, the energy transition and mining development, Mike. Thanks, Will. Um, so Mike Barton, Orion, we're the uh, largest provider of alternative financing to the mining sector. Um, I think you've all heard today that there's a huge amount of investment needed in the mining sector to support the uh, transition to a low carbon economy, energy transition. Uh, I hope you've also heard that there is an availability of material out there, theoretically. But the biggest constraint that we're seeing at the moment on actually um, meeting the requirements of energy transition is to finance uh, those, th those new projects that are needed. And I think there's three key challenges at the moment that we need to address um, as we consider the, the, the lack of financing flowing into the sector. Uh, number one is that established producers are actually still not reinvesting as much as they need to, to, to support the energy transition. Um, CAPEX is still at about 65% of the levels of the previous peak of the last cycle. That's an uptick last year from a low of about 30% for the last sort of five years before that. So that needs to change. And at the moment, there is available capital within those producers, but they're actually distributing it out to shareholders. So for the first year ever, you actually had more distributions than CAPEX in the mining industry, which is quite shocking. So there was 105% of um, uh, CAPEX actually distributed outwards, and that's a historical high. So there needs to be some reversal of that. I think on top of that, so that's the people who are already generating capital and not reinvesting it in sufficient volumes. On top of that, you've then got a lack of inflow into the sector. So where um, you know, we're down about 65% on absolute inflows into the sector across all equity, debt, and alternatives from, let's call it 2010. So there's a material reduction there. Um, where has that reduction come from? It's come, surprisingly, perhaps not from the banks. The banks compose about the same 25% of the capital going into the ground from, let's call it, non-cash non flow generated sources. So, you know, post, post GFC, they've not reduced any further. Um, alternatives like ourselves have doubled as a percentage. But if you think about that, that's effectively in absolute dollars only flat. So there's been a massive reduction in the available dollars and we comprise a doubling of the percentage. And then finally, the big shortfall has come from equity. So we need an ability to return on the equity taps to uh, continue an expansion of the alternative uh, sector and maintain, obviously, the provision of debt at those same levels. And we need the, uh, we need the mining companies to start, who are generating cash flows to start reinvesting into the ground. Otherwise, the biggest constraint, in my mind, on, on, an, on a transition to a low-carbon economy, this energy transition that we all talk about, is going to be a lack of funding to actually generate the new, uh, the, 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 those new mines. Thank you. And if I think back to some of the commentary made during this morning's sessions, then the, the price tags <laughs> to enable uh, sufficient critical minerals uh, for the clean energy transition, uh, 200 trillion plus is what I heard. Now, the collective balance sheets of every metals and mining company in the world 
if, if you don't wish to blow them up, don't come close to any, anything like that, even with significant amounts of incremental leverage. Uh, so it's not, it's not getting cheaper either, Will. I mean, that's the other point, of course. Like, I mean, gold, just, I appreciate it's not an energy transition metal, but using it as a proxy, um, you know, one dollar of gold produces 50% uh, less ounces than it did two years ago, which is quite incredible. So we have a, a very large deficit to solve, and we're going to come on to where we think some of the potential alternative capital sources are. If we can uh, go to Amanda now, also from the world of uh, private equity, you, you spend a lot of your time on funding pre-production projects. Uh, how are the funding sources there? Is there a similar uh, a gap, a deficit emerging? And uh, how are you seeing that? I think there's a huge gap in the market. Um, the amount, the amount of metal, the energy transition is basically a transition from fossil fuels onto metals. Uh, we need something like three or four hundred percent more overall commodity and metal production in the world in order to meet the goals of the energy transition, regardless of which technologies take us there. To do that, we're going to have to mine a lot more and probably recycle a lot more as well. But there's no way to get that metal unless we develop the mines. And we're, as a private equity group and alternatives provider, we, we invest in the development stage, which is one of the stages that's, that's least understood. Um, it's one thing to go out and find and explore uh, for new metals um, and, and find, it, find something in the ground. But once you've found something, you need to put a huge amount of time and effort into the plan and the testing required to figure out the ideal and most sustainable way to get that metal out of the ground. And that's what we finance. And we help finance them all the way into production with, with the help of uh, funds like Orion. But there's a huge, there's only so many of us. Um, there's maybe, you know, 10 or 15 active mining private equity groups in the world. Um, and that is going to come nowhere near to sufficient to allow us to actually mine the, the amount of metal required to make the energy transition happen. You're seeing it already with, I mean, it, it takes, there's a two year wait list to get a Tesla right now. Um, and that's not because Tesla doesn't want to sell you the car. It's because the supply chain is so backed up and people think that it's just the supply chains that are broken. There fundamentally isn't enough metal going into the supply chain to make the cars to begin with. So unless, and so people keep investing in things like gigafactories, but the gigafactories can't run unless someone goes in and spends five or 10 years developing all of the mines required to service those gigafactories and, and the metal that goes into the wind turbines and the solar panels. So really, I think if you want to fund the energy transition, the, one of the best places and the places where the, the funding is most necessary is in uh, development and construction in the mining sector. Great, thank you. So the answer is comprehensively, it's not from PE, it's not from banks. <laughs> Let's carry on going through the different pools of capital. Christopher, can we, can we look at public equity capital markets? And uh, I, I know you've got particular expertise within the Middle East uh, equity capital markets. Uh, are they a potential large solution? Uh, they're part of the solution. Uh, <clears throat> what is needed is a mix of all the elements because some of the public markets will not support projects at really very early phases of the development. Um, in fact, classic charts show that um, stock prices start to go down as a mining project starts to go into the early phases of development, which makes it a loser for the investors who got in uh, right at the start. Maybe it's just them exiting. Um, Geologists are going to hate me for saying this, but um, uh, finding the mine is not the easy part. Um, there are lots of mines out there. There are lots of known deposits. The hard part <coughs> is getting the money together, and I totally agree with Amanda on that. Um, uh, the amounts of money needed are enormous, so you really need to tap as many sources as you can. As you can. Um, here in the Middle East um, is an enormous pool of capital. And that is not a capital that is being mobilised here. 
um, either here or in the Gulf states towards the mining markets. It's actually being directed in part towards the, the traditional major mining finance centres. But there's no reason why we shouldn't see the development of almost the soup to nuts um, mining finance uh, structure in the Middle East. Um, and the, the, you know, the real success would be from developing the equity capital markets, particularly the stock exchanges, uh, like the uh, Tadawul here, which is the Saudi stock exchange, which has 200 listed stocks, but only two of those are miners. They are um, Maden and Amak, who was just on a few minutes ago. So um, it's, there, there's obviously space here to increase the number of listed miners. Now, in the short term, it may be foreign miners that get secondary listings here, maybe miners who are developing projects here. And it's quite clear from um, Robert Friedland's comments this morning that he, he will want to see more things done here by his group and his associated groups. Um, you know, eventually, maybe within the next year, who knows, we might see Ivanhoe Energy listed on the Tarawul. And that would be the start of potentially an avalanche of companies coming in for local listings, tapping the local capital, and then uh, raising the profile so that um, the man in the street investor and the institution in the street investor in uh, the kingdom gets to see that there are ways to access uh, the mining markets on their home territory. Great. If I could just jump in there. Sure. One of the things that's quite interesting about the Middle Eastern markets is that as they, there's a confluence of two major trends. One, as they that come together, as the Middle East tries to diversify its economies off of reliance on oil, um, they're looking for other industries. And industries like mining has more of a natural understanding to the average Middle Eastern investor who understands both industry and resources um, a priori, uh, which makes it a lot easier. Whereas the average investor in, in Europe or North America, they really only understand investing in, you know, the most industrial thing they've ever invested in is Tesla um, or Google or Facebook or something like that. So there really is an opportunity in terms of a willingness, I find, in the Middle East to, to one, look, they're actively looking for ways to diversify their economy and they do have a very natural understanding of major industry and resources that is often lacking, I find, in Western markets. Thank you. Dr. Elderwood, as a, an equity supporter of Marden, how is the PIF supporting the mining sector within the kingdom? Uh, thank you, William. So at PIF, we included metals and mining as one of the core sectors, one of the strategic sectors in our strategy for two main reasons. One. Um, because we believe in the endowment that we, ha we have here in the kingdom that's yet to be explored. Second, many of the other sectors, uh, metals and mining are main enablers to many of the other sectors that we are trying to develop uh, in the kingdom, from uh, aerospace and defense, automotive, building material, uh, renewables and others. Within mining, we have Ma'adin as our, uh, our champion and, and through which PIF is, is, is delivering its vision. And Ma'adin is a young company in the mining industry standards, only 25 years old. And, and, it's, and PIF supported the company since its inception through equity debt uh, as part of a, a larger plan to develop the mining sector here. And look at the results. I feel the results are somehow incredible. Uh, within, within this short time span, Ma'adin has grown to be one of the, um, I mean, the largest in the Middle East and with the fast growing companies, uh, in, uh, fast mining uh, companies to grow. All that is done while also partnering, having impactful partnership with global players like Alcoa, Barrick, and others. Um, at the same time, showing the economic and social impact that you would, you would hope for. If you go to the north and see the schools being built there and the impact on the citizens, it's quite incredible. I think the main lesson learned for, for us uh, is that in mining, to develop a mining industry, you need to have a long-term investment commitment uh, to, the, to the industry. And this is what a main differentiation for PIF uh, as a capital provider. And I think in general, investors need to have this long-term view uh, when it comes to mining. So finally, in, in, in our new strategy, we're reiterating our commitment to mining, 
and the development of the mining sector here in the kingdom. We hope to see Ma'adan grow further and show more successful example as an upstream operator and replicate some of these uh, stories we, we've seen in the phosphate and others, and in also new minerals. Great, thank you. And looking inwards at Sandy, for those that, that don't know, and I know most of the people in, in this room will be aware of the size of, of Martin, but, but it's a, a true giant mining company which, which stacks up you know, globally. It's a 50 uh, billion the, dollar with, uh, company. With the wider majors comfortably, and uh, you know, I think a lot of people are, are perhaps still more widely ignorant yep. on that fact. Giant phosphate, giant alley. Yep. Good. Jay, last but by no means least, can we pivot perhaps a little bit to, to the world of bulk? So I know you've been spending a lot of time on, on researching and talking to important stakeholders around decarbonisation technologies, which are so critical, particularly for steel, uh, given they are, what, 9% of annual GHGs in terms of global steel. Aluminium's next with 4% with of annual GHGs and, and every other metal in comparison with those two is a rounding error. So getting certainly steel right and decarbonized it is a priority uh, for, for the whole finance sector if it wants to continue to invest in steel. Thank you, William, and thank you to the Kingdom for, for having us here to have this really important discussion. I, I think you've heard a lot about potential solutions to this problem. I'm probably going to talk, as, as William says, about the biggest problem, which is the bulks. It is iron ore, it is bauxite for, for steel and, and aluminium, respectively. And, and the thing that I think is an important point to remember is, is uh, that the steel sector is largely an unloved sector for the equity world. It's, it's known as a, a dirty, uh, great big hulk of, of, of industry, which nobody really likes. It's never, never a popular sector for investors trading on sort of two or three times earnings. So. <clears throat> Finding money in in uh, the evolution of that should be more interesting because people want to support a, a, a move to evolve and a move to the green world. But if you look at what's happening in, in Europe in the steel sector, it is a government-funded program that is driving uh, most of, the, of that evolution in terms of energy transition. In the mining space, if you want to go green in bulks, you've just got to focus on two things, tons and grade. But the reality is that most of the good tons and grade have already been mined, both in, in bauxite and in, in iron ore. A, a very good example, we're talking about Robert Friedland's world, is, is his project in Guinea, which is probably one of the best iron ore projects in the world. Robert talks about the beluga caviar of, of iron ore. But it's in Guinea, which makes the financing challenge uh, sort of equal and opposite to the tons and grade being, being such a positive. I, I, think, I think when we look at mining through to, to downstream production of, of steel and aluminium, though, uh, there is a movement going on. Um, the Chinese led a, uh, a movement in, in greening up the world of, of steel production um, using Mr. Bessemer's blast furnace and, and basic oxygen furnace. Um, but that movement has to evolve one step further, and, and the likes of Hybrid are doing some amazing things in steel, which should be easy to finance, and they are being financed, and it's a combination of a, of a steel company and an energy company and a really strong partnership, which allowed them to get both government support and, and indeed equity support. But there is a headwind from, from the fact that people consider this to be a dirty space, and there's a headwind from, from legacy producers of steel who were not embracing the, the transition for quite some time and are only now coming to that game. And, and there are some people doing amazing things, but there are still people needing to do more. And I think that's because of a lack of finance that, that we've all talked about. And I know everyone has a different figure, but, but I've heard a, a two trillion price tag to decarbonize global steel over the next 20, 30 years, and I've heard one and a half trillion for global aluminium uh, to decarbonize those that, well, one, uh, to reduce the carbon smelting process, but, but also two, for those non-hydro power generated alley guys, then the coal generated stuff needs to uh, address that over time. Can we stay with you, please, Jay, if you don't mind? Um, and 
open up on the, the recycling theme and the role that recycling of metals has to play in, in the clean energy transition. H how do you see that working? Well, it's nice to have the biggest problem and, and also the biggest win. The biggest win we can all have is doing more recycling. And, and that's actually something that the steel space has been embracing for a long time because both steel and indeed aluminium are, are, are infinitely recyclable. And I think the, the observation that I would have and, and focus everyone on, something that Amanda and I were talking about earlier, is that the US market has adopted steel recycling ahead of the rest of the world. 60 to 70% of all steel in the US is, is produced from an electric arc furnace, whereas in Europe it's more like 15 to 20%. And fine, they've had a, a greater access to, to cheaper power and a, and a huge amount of scrap metal. But they've really embraced that, and there have been several great success stories in the equity markets who've been able to finance that growth in recycling by doing a very good job. And the same is true in, in, in aluminium, and the same is true in, in many of the things that we are trying to adopt in Europe. But again, in Europe, it has seen a need for uh, government intervention in, in the UK, um, we listened to, to Mr. Shapps talk this morning. One of the things that they will introduce later this year is the deposit return scheme, which is a way in which uh, us as consumers will be forced to recycle our scrap aluminium to a greater level, which, which doesn't necessarily increase the quantity of scrap, but it introduces a, a different element to the quality of scrap metal, which will allow people to, to recycle it better. And consequently, I think it allows a, a better flow of material, which should allow a better flow of finance to, to each of those projects. Thank you, Joe. And Amanda, great to hear your perspectives on the importance of uh, the recycling thematic. Recycling is a very interesting one. When most people think about all of the metals that we theoretically need for the energy transition, um, they think about the fact that we need to mine all those metals. Uh, the sort of general estimates are we need about five, we need to mine five times more lithium per year um, by the time we get to 2050 to meet the needs of the energy transition. It's also five times more graphite and five times more cobalt. That's a huge amount of metal to find, develop, um, and get out of the ground. And, and there's a lot of people thinking, can we find that much metal? And, and if we need 200 trillion to mine it, is that really the best spending of the money? Given that one of the easiest ways to potentially reduce the amount we need to mine is to actually recycle it. Um, my team and I are looking actively at, at opportunities within recycling in, in the global industry, and we euphemistically call it urban mining. But the truth is, your car, once you're done with it, and your cell phone, and you know, the big wind turbines that are offshore, come 10 years, five, 10 years, they all need to be recycled, and we can either throw them in a garbage heap or recycle them. In the US, they're doing a great job. Uh, steel, aluminum, as well as uh, copper have, have fairly decent recycling rates, and they're working very hard at it. But the lithium-ion battery or supply chain has horrible rates of recycling. We recycle only 1% of global lithium. Um, and it, I think if governments globally really wanted to uh, contribute to sustainability, as well as reduce the, the mining burden in the world and find alternative sources, green sources, low carbon sources of metal to fund the energy transition, one of the easiest places to look is at developing really good circular economies and recycling programs in, in every country. Thank you. Speaking of urban mining, banks are starting to, to look at the recyclers and uh, without mentioning names, we recently started to lend to uh, a PGM recycler, which hit, before that, I didn't know that was a thing. Um, and uh, they only need to add a refiner, and they'll have to have the South African producers uh, on their toes. Anyway, speaking of circularity, uh, Mike, back to you. So what is the potential answer uh, to, to, to fund the, the deficit uh, of funding? So I think um, we probably need to start with price, actually. 
I mean, it's often overlooked. We can all say we need more capital flow into the sector, but fundamentally we need incentive prices in most commodities to, to, to support and justify people um, investing. And we're not at those levels, let's be clear, today, you know, we're, we're, we're nowhere near them. And even if we don't see them on a prolonged basis, we need people to at least be taking a medium-term view. So most people out there today will happily predict that commodity X is going to increase to, you know, X percent over the next few years. But a lot of investors today are very concerned about short-termism in the, in the next quarter. And obviously that means that they don't put money in. So, I mean, you know, we're busy fundraising at the moment. And a lot of the discussions I have with pensions, for example, not picking on pensions, but will be, yeah, we totally buy into this, but are the next two years not going to be tough? Well, we're a 10-year fund. Who cares? You, you know, that's not, you, you shouldn't be investing in us if you care about the next quarter, quarter of commodity prices. So let's, let's just assume that the commodities prices justify investment. I think the next part of the answer then is, as actually Christopher touched upon, it's no one piece. There's no one piece of the, of the capital uh, supply that is the answer. It needs to come from all sources. So we've already heard from, from PIF. That's a wonderful development and, you know, long may that continue. And it'd be great to see more strategics, let's call it, around the world taking similar actions. So that's absolutely, let's call it a new historically new source of capital coming into the space that, that we haven't had before. Um, we also need those incentive prices to justify the established mining companies to start reinvesting more. At the moment, their shareholders don't necessarily want them to do that, but if they turn back into growth stories, then that's the point in time that their shareholders will support them uh, turning that, that reinvestment rate back to, at the very least, a, a, a positive rather than the negative it is at the moment. Um, we also need people to give more money to Orion. And, <laughs> and, and, and that's, and that, sorry, that's only half a joke. I, I, actually, we need people to give money to all of the alternatives. Um, you know, I saw our friends at RCF, uh, Resource Capital, in the audience as well. We need people to give more money to funds like Orion, uh, to invest in Orion, to invest in Resource Capital, to invest in, in Amanda's fund. Um, because we actually need all of us. There's not much competition in this space. It's more a case of ensuring that there is lots of forms of capital coming in. And then finally, as Christopher touched upon, we need active stock markets. And really there, we need people to believe in those prices. Again, coming back full circle to, to, to that situation. So Christopher, that segues very nicely into how do we mobilize better? What are the factors required to, to get that public equity capital into this sector? Well, certain markets, uh, the Australian market, the Canadian market, to a degree, the UK market, and to a lesser degree, Johannesburg, have long had a constituency of, of retail investors, but they've had the whole ecosystem, right from large institutions right down to, uh, to retail, that understand to a degree, some of these investors only understand gold, others understand a lot more about the mining space, um, and so for the Middle East, for the Kingdom, for the Gulf states, uh, you really need to cultivate a knowledge of mining. It doesn't have to be enormously deep, but an understanding of the fact that, as, um, as my colleague here pointed out, uh, the prices go up, the prices go down, they look like it's going to be a disaster and you're going to be depressed for years. But in fact, if you look at the tin price, which uh, fell monstrously during last year, it bounced dramatically at the very end of the year and it's up 50% from where it was in November. But for investors, you know, that can be a hair-raising ride, but they need to be aware that hair-raising rides, if you're of the buy low, uh, um, sell high phenomenon, that's how you make money. And so, um, but they have to be uh, aware of that. Uh, and you also have to educate. So our group here today in the audience and out outside are relatively high net worth, sophisticated investors. And they're part of the learning curve here. The learning curve has to go out further if we're to create not only equity capital markets that will support mining, but ones that are liquid as well. And you can have institutions buy up the whole market and then you've got no liquidity. Um, what you need is the full ecosystem, and that requires some education. It requires media coverage, it requires events, 
uh, both like this for high net worths and, and institutions, but also the type of mass retail event that you see in, uh, say, PDAC in Toronto or uh, the events that happen in, Austra in Australia. So um, it's an education process. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, the education displayed here today is a quantum leap from what we saw, and I think Amanda would agree, a year ago here. People have climbed up the learning curve here, and that's important. Education, great, thank you. Uh, two other potential alternatives, capital, to, to plug that very, very large deficit that we're starting to see are coming from the wider EV value chain ecosystem. And we've started to see capital flowing in from both the OEMs, the auto manufacturers themselves, directly into whether long-term uh, cheap funding or direct minority equity participations, as well as the same from the battery producers. So that's not going to materially fill the gap, but that is another newer influx of capital. And of course, the, the, the biggest gap, I imagine, will be plugged by society at large as represented by governments, nationally, regionally. And if you look at what the United States legislated in August of last year in terms of the, of the Inflation Reduction Act, that gives huge tax incentives for NAFTA-based producers as well as their trade friends uh, to to get tax incentives for big investments on EV value chain, and that may partially fill some of the gap. I don't want to wish to deprive Dr. Alderwood of any more oxygen for the last uh, few remaining minutes. <laughs> so, Dr. Alderwood, please bring us home on how the PIF can facilitate Saudi Kingdom becoming a, a green hub for the metals and mining sector. Thank you. I, be, I believe the kingdom has the right ingredients to be a uh, green metal sub, and, uh, and PIF will invest in these ingredients to enable that. I, I'll mention five of those. One, we have, the ups, we have access to the upstream minerals, whether it is uh, here in the kingdom that we are doing, exploring and exploiting, or um, we're going to secure from outside the, the kingdom our strategic investment. And this, morning, this afternoon, we announced our JV with Maadin uh, for, uh, to invest in international, uh, internationally in strategic minerals. Second, the kingdom is uh, well located, uh, strategically located in terms of uh, ge geography uh, with, uh, on, on trade routes and uh, uh, proximity to key markets. Um, and I believe with, with trade agreements, etc., we will be able to access uh, uh, significant markets. And PIF is investing in uh, what, uh, transport and logistics is one of our strategic sectors, and we're investing heavily in the infrastructure of, of, uh, of the sector, whether it's the rail network, the port, etc. Third, I believe the local consumption will be a defining factor here, driven by Vision 2030 project and also PIF project. Um, we're seeing, for example, um, today uh, the Bow Steel uh, steel plate announcement. Um, it's driven by the availability of uh, shipbuilding uh, next to it in Ras al-Khair. Um, it's the same thing for automotive, is driving uh, rolled aluminium production, uh, cable manufacturing uh, driving aluminium and, and copper as well. And, and fourth, um, I think the kingdom is well positioned now to be a leader globally in renewable energy with 50% com with commitment or targets to make 50% of our electricity generation from uh, from renewable sources. PIF is committing to, uh, to develop 70% of that commitment. Uh, fifth, um, I think uh, uh, touching on the point around capital market, we have a, a solid capital market that's evolving and developing, making e uh, access to financing easier. And PIF has multiple initiatives in, in this space, including uh, our uh, green finance framework, uh, uh, our green bonds, which will, uh, the procedure which will, will support uh, greener projects, and, and, and finally, the voluntary carbon market, which was announced a few months ago. So you sum all that, you, you add the improved business environment, clearer uh, government incentive framework. I think we have a compelling case uh, to, to have to, for the kingdom to be a green metal hub. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our five panelists for their insightful, insightful contributions. Thank you.